So this class is a reading from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And I think most of you know about this book. It was written by Mahendranath Gupta, and he was present during these talks that Sri Ramakrishna gave in Dakshineswar. And m much of it takes place Um, outside uh, his room or in his room um, there near the Kali temple. I'll begin with a chant. Om Hridaya Kamala Madhye Rajitam Nirvikalpam Sada sada kila beda tika meka swarupam Prakriti vikriti shunyam nityam ananda murtim Vimala paramahamsam ramakrishnam bhajama Nirupa mamati sukshmam nishprapancham nirhiham Gaganas sadrisham isham sarva bhuta divasam Triguna rahita satchit brahma rupam varanyam Vimala paramahamsam Ramakrishnam bhajama Vitaritum avatirnam jnana bhakti prashanti Pranaya galita chittam jiva dukha sahishnu Dritta sahaja samadim jinmayam komalangam Bhimala paramahamsam Ramakrishnam bhajamaha this is the meditation on Sri Ramakrishna. This knower of Brahman, ever established in his own nature, full of wisdom, self-possessed and self-lighted, eternal, the very image of that Brahman who is pure bliss, shining ceaselessly in the lotus of the heart, alone and without parts, pure and still. This Ramakrishna, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. Subtle, fine and luminous, not even the shadow of the gross can ever reach him, for his purity is without parallel. Untouched by Maya's webs of deceit, beyond the dark river of time and desire, vast as the sky, this Supreme Lord the very essence of Brahman as existence and light, this Ramakrishna, Paramatman Supreme, we adore. Saturated with divine consciousness, his home is in all. He hears every cry. He knows every pain. Under the weight of its compassion, his heart can deny the need of none. Born to raise the world with teachings of knowledge, love, and peace. Born to bring mankind fresh songs of joy. This certain refuge of all, this Ramakrishna, Paramahamsa, Paramatma Supreme, we adore. Now the way I've been doing this is I've been taking um, a little bit uh, about different ones of Sri Ramakrishna's young disciples. And most of these were present at the time um, that these talks went on. And so you'll get reference to them in this gospel. And it just gives us an idea of the group of people that he had around him at this time. This one is um, from about Swami Akandananda, who became 
one of the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, and it was when he was quite young. Once I spent the night at Dakshineswar with several other disciples, and the master had us all sit for meditation. While communing with our chosen deities, we often laughed and wept in ecstasy. The pure joy we experienced in those boyhood days cannot be expressed in words. When I approached the master, he would invariably ask me, did you shed tears at the time of prayer or meditation? One day when I answered yes to this, how happy he was. Tears of repentance or sorrow flow from the corners of the eyes nearest the nose, he said, and those of joy from the outer corners of the eyes. Since the master asked me, Suddenly, do you know how to pray? Saying this, he flung his hands and feet about restlessly like a little child, impatient for its mother. Then he cried out, Mother, I don't want anything else. I can't live without you. While thus teaching us how to pray, he looked just like a small boy. Profuse tears rolled down his chest, and he passed into deep samadhi, I was convinced that the master did that for my sake. One morning, Sri Ramakrishna took me to the Kali temple, and whenever I went there alone, I stood outside the threshold. But on this occasion, the master took me into the sanctum sanctorum and showed me the face of Lord Shiva, who was, of course, lying on his back while Kali stood over him. His face was not visible from outside the shrine, where one could see only the top of his head. The master said, look, here is the living Shiva. I felt that Lord Shiva was conscious and breathing. I was astonished. How potent were the master's words. Up to that time, I had thought the image was like any other image of Shiva I had seen. Sri Ramakrishna then gently pulled Mother Kali's cloth and placed the ornaments on her properly. When we left the temple, he was reeling like a drunkard. He was escorted to his room with difficulty and remained for some time in samadhi. I cannot describe the details of that day. The joy the master poured into my heart cannot be communicated. After coming down from Samadhi, the master sang many songs in an ecstatic mood. On another occasion, Gangadhar went to Dakshineswar and found that the master was in Samadhi. When he came down to normal consciousness, he spoke of God vision and self-realization, saying, one's own chosen deity is one's own self. This chosen deity and the Atman are identical. The vision of the chosen deity is equivalent to self-knowledge. So that's all I will read of just this little section about Swami Akhandananda. But as you see, he was one of the people who was there at this time, and Sri Krishna was giving them instructions. So we are with um, we've been reading for some time, but periodically. And so we're in the chapter M at Dakshineswar. We're on page 355, for those of you who are following online. Um, M. Is it possible to develop both jnana and bhakti? by the practice of spiritual discipline. Master, through the path of bhakti, a man may attain them both, if it is necessary. God gives him knowledge of Brahman, but in a highly qualified aspirant, may a, he may develop both jnana and bhakti at the same time. Such is the case with the Ishwara Kotis, Chaitanya, for example. But the case of ordinary devotees is different. There are five kinds of light. The light of a lamp, 
the light of various kinds of fire, the light of the moon, the light of the sun, and lastly, the combined light of the sun and the moon. Bhakti is the light of the moon, and jnana is the light of the sun. Sometimes it is seen that the sun has hardly set when the moon rises in the sky. An incarnation of God one sees at the same, that at the same time, the sun of knowledge and the moon of love. This is something that probably we all have seen in our lives in nature. Um, I recently was in Northern California and coming back over the Golden Gate Bridge, there was that phenomena where the, the sun and the moon were rising at the same time. It's quite beautiful. It was at Guru Purnima time. And I think it's the wolf moon or something, but it was absolutely enormous. And it was also Garrow were colored. It was just beautiful. And we were up there to um, visit with some of the girls who were taking their final vows. So it was very significant for them, this event. But here he's saying that it's like the sun of knowledge and the moon of love. And he says that in the incarnations, this is the case. Can everyone by the mere wish develop knowledge and love at the same time? It depends on the person. One bamboo is more hollow than another. Is it possible for all to comprehend the nature of God? Can a one seer pot hold five seers of milk? M. But what about the grace of God? Through his grace, a camel can pass through the eye of a needle. This reminds me of something I once read also. Um, there was a place, evidently, where there was a wall, and there was a gate through the wall. And in order to get through that gate, the camels had to kneel and go on their knees. And it was called the Eye of the Needle. So this actually was a, a place in ancient times. But we use it as a, a simile because, of course, it comes in the Bible, this passes through the eye of a needle. Master, but is it possible to obtain God's grace just like that? A beggar may get a penny if he asks for it. But suppose he asks you right off for the train fare. How about that? M stood silent. The master, too, remained silent. Suddenly he said, yes, it is true. Through the grace of God, some may get both jnana and bhakti. M saluted the master and went back to the bell tree. At midday, finding that M had not yet returned, Sri Ramakrishna started toward the bell tree. But on reaching the Panchavati, he met M carrying his prayer cop, carpet and water jug. M saluted the master. Sri Ramakrishna said to M, I was coming to look for you. Because of your delay, I thought you might have scaled the wall and run away. I watched your eyes this morning and felt apprehension, lest you should go away like Naran Shastri. Then I said to myself, no, he won't run away. He thinks a great deal before doing anything. He was actually a school teacher and taught many of these young disciples and actually brought many of them to Sri Ramakrishna for the first time. But he was only about 28 years old, I think. He was, he was fairly young then. The same night, the master talked to Amra Kal, Latu Harish, and a few other devotees, master to M. Some people give a metaphysical interpretation of the Brindavan episode of Sri, Ra of Sri Krishna's life. What do you say about it? M. There are various opinions. What if there are? You have told us the story of Bhishma Deva's weeping on his bed of arrows because he could not understand anything of God's ways. Again, you've told us that Hanuman used to say, I don't know anything about the day of the week, 
the position of the stars, and so forth. I only meditate on Rama. Further, you have said to us that in the last analysis, there are two things only, Brahman and its power. You have also said that after the attainment of Brahmajnana, a man realizes these two to be one, the one that has no two. So this is kind of a, a summation in some ways of many of his teachings, um, which are both uh, non-dual and dual. And he will get into it more in this section. But this is how he realized God and what it meant to live what, in what he called the Vigyana state with after realization where you can see that everything is God. What do we call the Vedanta Society? He's really a shock that right? Yeah, he, it, I was going to say it's very much like different tantric things as well. He is that. And um, people saw him as mother, but he also worshipped the mother. You know, so he is a a shakta as well. But he did have a um, teacher, you know, who taught him non-dualistic Vedanta, and he realized, you know, Nirvikalpa Samadhi. But then he went kind of beyond that and stayed, he said he liked to stay in the place of Bhava Mukta, which is kind of like a doorway between the two states of Samadhi and the, and the world. So he's just, a very unique person. You can't say he's only a shakta, because he wasn't. And people also experienced him as Shiva. So he was all those things together. So diverse opinions certainly exist. Nagta, who was his um, sannyasi guru, used to say that the monks could not be feasted because of the diversity of their views. Once a feast was arranged for the sannyasis, monks belonging to many sects were invited. Everyone claimed that his sect should be fed first, but no conclusion be, could be arrived at. And at last, they all went away, and the food had to be given to the prostitutes. <laughs> they were so busy, you know, arguing over the details of the thing that, you know, anyway. Um, Totapuri was indeed a great soul, master. But Hazra says he was an ordinary man. <laughs> there is no use in discussing these things. Everyone says his watch alone gives the correct time. You see, Narayan Shastri developed a spirit of intense renunciation. He was a great scholar. He gave up his wife and went away. A man attains yoga when he completely effaces woman and gold from his mind. With some, the characteristics of the yogi are well marked. I shall have to tell you something of the six centers. The mind of the yogi passes through all these, and he realizes God through his grace. Have you heard of the six centers? M. These are the seven planes of Vedanta. Master, not the Vedanta, but the Vedas. Do you know what the six centers are like? They are the lotuses of the subtle body. The yogis see them. They are like the fruit and leaves of a wax tree. M. Yes, sir. The yogis can perceive them. I've read that there is a kind of glass through which tiny objects look very big. Likewise, through yoga, one can see these subtle lotuses. Following Sri Ramakrishna's direction, M spent the night in the hut at the Panchavati. In the early hours of the morning, he was singing alone. I am without the least benefit of prayer and austerity, O Lord. I am the lowest of the lowly. Make me pure with thy hallowed touch. One by one I pass my days in hope of reaching thy lotus feet. But thee, alas, 
I have not found. Suddenly, M glanced toward the window and saw the master standing there. Sri Ramakrishna's eyes became heavy with tears as M sang the line, I am the lowest, lowest of the lowly. Make me pure with thy hallowed touch. M sang again, I shall put on the ochre robe and earrings made of conch shell. Thus, in the garb of a yogini, from place to place I will wander till I have found my cruel hari. M saw that the master was walking with Rakal. Friday, December 21st, 1883. In the morning, the master and M were conver conversing alone under the bell tree. The master told him many secrets of spiritual discipline, exhorting him to renounce woman and gold. He further said that the mind at times becomes one's true guru. After his midday meal, the master went to the Panchavati wearing a beautiful yellow robe. Two or three Vaishnava monks were there, clad in the dress of their sect. In the afternoon, a monk belonging to the sect of Nanta, Nanak arrived. He was a worshiper of the formless God. Sri Ramakrishna asked him to meditate as well on God with form. The master said to him, dive deep. One does not get the precious gems by merely floating on the surface. God is without form, no doubt, but he also has form. By meditating on God with form, one speedily acquires devotion, and then one can meditate on the formless God. It's like throwing a letter away after learning its content and then setting out to follow the instructions. Saturday, December 22nd, 1883. Rakal, Harish, M, and Latu had been staying with Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineswar. About nine o'clock in the morning, the master was sitting with them on the southeast veranda of his room. When Balaram's father and Devendra Ghosh of Shambhukur arrived, a devotee. How does one obtain love for God? Master, go forward. The king dwells beyond the seven gates. You can see him only after passing through the gates. At the time of the installation of Annapurna at Chanak, I said to Dwark Kababu, large fish live in the deep water of a big lake. Throw some spice bait into the water, and then the fish will come, attracted by its smell, and now and then they will make the water splash. Devotion and ecstatic love of God are like that spiced bait. God sports in the world as man. He incarnates himself as a man, as in the case of Krishna, Rama, and Chaitanya. Once I said to Keshav, the greatest manifestation of God is in man. There are small holes in the bulk of the field where crabs and fish accumulate in the rainy season. If you want to find them, you have to seek them there in the holes. If you seek God, you must seek him in an incarnation. The Divine Mother of the Universe manifests herself through this three and a half cubit man. There is a song that says, O oh, mother, what machine is this that thou hast made? What pranks thou playest with this toy, three and a half cubits high? One needs spiritual practice in order to know God and recognize divine incarnations. Big fish live in a large lake. But to see them, one must throw the spice bait into the water. 
there is butter in milk, but one must churn the butter, churn the milk to get it. There's oil in the mustard seed, but one has to press the seed to extract the oil. Devotee, has God form or is he formless? Master, wait, wait. First of all, you have to go to Calcutta. Only then will you know where the Maidan Asiatic Society and the Bengal Bank are located. If you want to, want to go to the Brahmin quarter of Kardaha, you must first go to Kardaha. Why should it not be possible to practice the discipline of the formless God? But it's very difficult to follow that path. One cannot follow it without renouncing lust and greed. There must be complete renunciation, both inner and outer. You cannot succeed in this path if you have the slightest trace of worldliness. It is easy to worship God with form, but not as easy as all that. One should not discuss the discipline of the impersonal God or the path of knowledge with a bhakta. Through great effort, perhaps, he is just cultivating a little devotion. You will injure it if you explain away everything as a mere dream. Kabir was a worshiper of the impersonal God. He did not believe in Shiva, Kali, or Krishna. He used to make fun of them and say that Kali lived on the offerings of rice and bananas and that Krishna danced like a monkey when the gopis clapped their hands. Everybody laughed. One who worships God without form perhaps sees at first the deity with ten arms, then the deity with four arms, then the baby Krishna with two arms, and at last he sees the indivisible light and he merges in it. It is said that sages like Daitreya and Jadabharata did not return to the relative plane after having the vision of Brahman. According to some people, Sukadev tasted only a drop of that ocean of Brahman consciousness. He saw and heard the rumbling of the waves of that ocean, but he did not dive into it. A brahmachari once said to me, one who goes beyond Kedar cannot keep his body alive. Likewise, a man cannot preserve his body after attaining Brahmagyana. And there's a footnote here. The case of an ordinary aspirant, the body drops off after he attains knowledge of Brahman, but this is not the case of a divine incarnation because he is born with a special mis mission to teach mankind. I know that mythically speaking, Ram is Shiv's guru and Shiv's Ram's guru, but Narayan, his uh, first vision of, was the divine mother. Now he's very young, he saw that the darshan of Kalima. So wouldn't then it would make sense for Shravan to give Kalima mantra? Give him Ram mantra, and isn't his nature a Shiva nature anyway? So shouldn't he have been working with like Om or Soham or something? Yeah, but if he has a Shiva nature, then Rama is the correct mantra. The the priests in the Shiva's they temples wrong. they write wrong yeah, on the wrong. they the they're Shiva. offering yeah, but he it goes both ways. <laughs> Does it balance out? Balance, I don't know, but it. Um, who the person's chosen ideal is, I think the guru can see that very clearly. In fact, Swami Shivananda once said that when he first met people, what he would see was their chosen ideal in their heart, and then he would see the form of the devotee. So a really illumined guru knows, you know, which deity is correct. 
for the person. But he's discussing here how um, most people can't have a, a very high, like a nervicalpa samadhi and retain their bodies. Because, I mean, we, we read about it and it's, we take it kind of lightly, but these states of illumination are really something. Even to see your chosen deity as a living reality is, um, it shakes your whole body. You have to have a very pure mind and body in order to be able to do spiritual practice and to realize God because if you aren't, then you'll fall from it almost immediately. So that's why they emphasize purity and practice so much because um, it's really important because you're strengthening your being. So with most people, as he says here, the body drops af off after 21 days, but not for an incarnation. Yes, yes. He initiated many of them in the Ram Mantra, actually. I know um, Ranjananda was another one that he did. So, but I don't know, because I, I mean, I don't know uh, what they meditated on later in their lives. I mean, I know they viewed him as an incarnation of God and as God himself. So how they meditated, we often are, um, people will meditate on their guru and then on their ishta. And they say often the guru will come to you and take you to your ishta and that will take you into the um, light or whatever, I mean, like you talked about here. So it isn't that it negates because you're meditating on a particular deity that it negates other um, experiences. And as you go deeper to have that non-dual experience, that also will come to a person. When you say that Swami Shivananda could see the chosen idea of the Yes. Person. Yeah. So. But I think that at that point, I think the um, presidents of the order were initiated with the Ramakrishna mantra. But I don't, I don't know that. I wasn't there. Now, of course, that begs the question of beach mantras. Ramakrishna must have initiated them into several beach mantras, if they can choose between. Yeah, he probably did. I mean, he certainly told them different ones, you know, because they were trained to initiate other people because they were very advanced souls. But many of them were Ishwara Kodis to begin with, so they were already free. These um, boys that were around him. So the, he, we were talking about, a brahmachari once said to me, one who goes beyond Kedar cannot keep his body alive. alive. Likewise, a man cannot pre preserve his body after attaining Brahmagyana. The body drops off in 21 days. So for normal people, that's true. Of course, normal people don't realize Brahmagyana, so they're not normal. <laughs> anyway. There was an infinite field beyond a high wall, and four friends tried to find out what was beyond the wall. Three of them, one after another, climbed the wall and saw the field and burst into loud laughter and dropped to the other side. These three could not give any information about the field. Only the fourth man came back and told people about it. He's like those who retain their bodies 
even after attaining Brahma Jnana, in order to teach others, divine incarnations belong to this class. I've heard another way of, um, of describing this story. He tells the story more than once in the gospel. And one way that it is told is that the fourth man, after seeing all these people jump into the garden, he wanted to be able to tell other people. So he tied a rope around himself and tied it to the tree. And then when he tried to jump, he was held back by this rope. And that rope is compassion for living beings, according to Swami Shivananda. That's the one desire that a monk can legitimately keep, is that compassion for other beings. Parvati was born as the daughter of King Himalaya. After her birth, she revealed to the king her various divine forms. The father said, well, daughter, you've shown me all these forms. That is nice. But you have another aspect, which is Brahman. Please show me that. Father, replied Parvati, if you seek the knowledge of Brahman, then renounce the world and live in the company of holy men. But King Himalaya insisted. Thereupon, Parvati revealed her Brahman form, and immediately the king fell down unconscious. All that I have just said belongs to the realm of reasoning. Brahman alone is real, and the world is illusory. That is reasoning. And everything that Brahman is like a dream. But this is an extremely difficult path. To one who follows it, even the divine play of the world becomes like a dream and appears unreal. His eye also vanishes. The followers of this path do not accept divine incarnation. It's a very difficult path. The lovers of God should not hear much of such reasoning. That is why God incarnates himself as man and teaches people the path of devotion. He exhorts people to cultivate self-surrender to God, following the path of devotion, one realizing everything through his grace, both knowledge and supreme wisdom. God sports in this world. He is under the control of his devotee. Shama, the Divine Mother, is herself tied by the cord of love of her devotee. Sometimes God becomes the magnet and the devotee the needle. And sometimes the devotee becomes the magnet and God the needle. The devotee attracts God to him God is the beloved of his devotee and is under his control. According to one school, the gopis of Vrindavan, like Yashoda, had believed in the formless God in their previous births, but they did not derive any satisfaction from this belief. That is why later they enjoyed so much bliss in the company of Sri Krishna in the Vrindavan episode of his life. One day Krishna said to the gopis, come along, I shall show you the abode of the eternal. Let us go to the Jamuna for a bath. And as they dived into the water of the river, they at once saw Gokula. Next they saw the indivisible light. Thereupon Yashoda exclaimed, O oh Krishna, we don't care for these things anymore. We would like to see you in your human form. I want to take you in your arms and feed you. So the greatest manifestation of God is through his incarnation. The devotee should worship and serve the incarnations of God as long as he lives in the human body. At the break of day, he disappears into the secret chamber of his house. Not all, by any means, can recognize an incarnation of God. Assuming a human body, 
The incarnation falls a victim to disease, grief, hunger, thirst, and all such things, like ordinary mortals. Rama wept for Sita. Brahman weeps entrapped in the snare of the five elements. It is said in the Purana that God, in his incarnation as a sow, lived happily with his young ones even after the destruction of Hiranyakasha. As the sow, he nursed them and forgot all about his abode in heaven. At last, Shiva killed the sow body with his trident, and God, laughing aloud, went to his own abode. In the afternoon, Bhavanaf arrived. Rakal, M. Harish, and others were in the room. Master to Bhavana, to love an incarnation of God, that is enough. Ah, what ecstatic love the gopis had for Krishna. Sri Ramakrishna began to sing, assuming the attitude of the gopis. Oh, Krishna, you are the soul of my soul. Then he sang, I'm not going home, O oh friend for there it is hard for me to chant my Krishna's name. And again, O oh friend, that day I stood at my door as you were going to the woods. Continuing, the master said, when Krishna suddenly disappeared in the act of dancing and playing with the gopis, they were beside themselves with grief. Looking at a tree, they said, O oh tree, you must be a great hermit. You must have seen Krishna, otherwise, why do you stand there motionless, as if absorbed in samadhi? Looking at the earth covered with green grass, they said, O oh, earth, you must have seen Krishna. Otherwise, why does your hair stand on end? You must have enjoyed the thrill of his touch. Looking at the Madhavi creeper, they said, O oh, Madhavi, give us back our Madhava. The gopis were intoxicated with ecstatic love for Krishna. Akura came to Vrindavan to take Krishna and Balarama to Mathura. When they mounted the chariot, the gopis clung to the wheels. They would not let the chariot move. Saying this, Sri Ramakrishna sang, assuming the attitude of Akura. Hold not. Hold not the chariot wheels. Is it the wheels that make it move? The mover of the wheels is Krishna, by whose will the whole world is moved. Master, is it the wheels that make it move? By whose will the worlds are moved? The driver moves the chariot at his master's bidding. I feel deeply touched by these lines. Sunday, December 23rd, 1883. At nine o'clock in the morning, Sri Ramakrishna was seated on the southwest porch of his room with Rakal, Latu, M, Harish, and some other devotees. M had now <clears throat> been nine days with the master at Dakshineswar. Earlier in the morning, Ma Mohan had arrived in Kanagar on his way to Calcutta. Hazra, too, was present. A Vaishnava was singing, referring to one of the songs, Sri Ramakrishna. I said, I didn't enjoy that song very much. Excuse me. The songs of the earlier singers seem to have more right spirit. Once I sang for Nanta at the Panchavati. To arms, to arms, O oh man. Death storms your house in battle array. I sang another. O oh mother, I have no one else to blame. Alas, I sink in the well these very hands have dug. Nangta, the Vedantist, was a man of profound knowledge. The song moved him to tears, though he did not understand its meaning. 
Padma Lochan also wept when I sang the song of Ram Pasad about the Divine Mother. He was truly a great pundit. After the midday meal, Sri Ramakrishna rested a few minutes in his room. M was sitting on the floor. The master was delighted to hear the music that was being played in the Nahavat. He then explained to M that Brahman alone has become the universe and all living beings. Master, referring to a certain place, someone once said to me, nobody sings the name of God there. It has no holy atmosphere. No sooner did he say this than I perceived it was God alone who had become all living beings. They appeared as countless bubbles or reflections in the ocean of Satchitananda. Again, I find sometimes that living beings are like so many pills made of indivisible consciousness. Once I was on my way to Burdwan from Kamarpukur. At one place, I ran into the meadow to see how living beings are sustained. I saw ants crawling there. It appeared to me that every place was filled with consciousness. Hazra entered the room and sat on the floor. Master, again I perceive that living beings are like different flowers with various layers of petals. They are also revealed to me as bubbles, some big, some small. While describing in this way the vision of different divine forms, the master went into an ecstatic state and said, I have become, I am here. Uttering these words, he went into samadhi. His body was mot motionless. He remained in that state for a long time and then gradually regained partial consciousness of the world. He began to laugh like a boy and paced the room. His eyes radiated bliss as if he had seen a wondrous vision. His gaze was not fixed on any particular object and his face beamed with joy. Still pacing the room, the master said, I saw the Paramahamsa who stayed under the banyan tree walking with just that smile. Am I too in that state of mind? He sat on the small couch and engaged in conversation with the Divine Mother, Master. I don't even care to know. Mother, may I have pure love for thy lotus feet. To M. One attains this state immediately after freeing oneself of all grief and desire to the Divine Mother. Mother, thou hast done away with my worship. Please see, Mother, that I don't give up all desire. Mother, the Paramahamsa is but a child. Does a child need a mother? Therefore, thou art the mother I am the child. How can the child live without the mother? Sri Ramakrishna was talking to the Divine Mother in a voice that would have melted even a stone. Again he addressed her, saying, Mere knowledge of Advaita, I spit on it. Dost thou exist as long as thou dost keep the ego in me? The Paramahamsa is but a child. Doesn't a child need a mother? M sat there speechless and looked at the divine manifestation in the master. He said to him, the master is an ocean of mercy that knows no motive. He has kept himself in the state of Paramahamsa that he might, as a teacher, awaken the spiritual consciousness of myself and other earnest souls. M. Further thought. The Master says, Advaita Chaitanya Nityananda. That is to say, knowledge of the non-dual Brahman 
one attains consciousness and enjoys eternal bliss. The master has not only attained the knowledge of non-duality, but is in a state of eternal bliss. He is always drunk with ecstatic love for the mother of the universe. With folded hands, Hazar looked at the master and said every now and then, how blessed you are, how blessed you are, master to Hazra. But you have hardly any faith. You simply live here and add to the play, like Jatila and Kutila. <laughs> In the afternoon, M paced the temple garden alone. He was deeply absorbed in the thought of the master and was pondering the master's words concerning the attainment of the exalted state of Paramahamsa after the elimination of grief and desire. Master said to himself, who is this Sri Ramakrishna acting as my teacher? Has God embodied himself for our welfare? The master himself says that no one but an incarnation can come down to the phenomenal plane from the state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Monday, December 24th, 1883. At eight o'clock in the morning, Sri Ramakrishna and M were talking together in the pine grove at the northern end of the temple garden. This was the 11th day of M's stay with the master. It was winter. The sun had just risen. The river was flowing north with the tide. Not far off could be seen the bell tree where the master had practiced great spiritual austerities. Sri Ramakrishna faced the east as he talked to his disciple and told him about the knowledge of Brahman. Emma's very good at painting a picture for us of the surroundings. And for those of you who've seen Dakshineswar in the temple garden, it brings it all back. As you read it, you can see the different places. Master, the formless God is real, and equally real is God with form. Nangta used to instruct me about the nature of Satchitananda Brahman. He would say that it is like an infinite ocean, water everywhere, to the right, to the left, above and below, water enveloped in water. It is the water of the great cause, motionless, waves springing up when it becomes active. Its activities are creation, preservation, and destructive. Again, he used to say that Brahman is where reason comes to a stop. There's the instance of camphor. Nothing remains after it is burnt off, not even a trace of ash. Brahman is beyond mind and speech. There's um, different scriptures which say mind turns back along with speech. A salt doll entered the ocean to measure its depth, but it did not return to tell others how deep the ocean was. It melted into the ocean itself. The rishis once said to Rama, O oh Rama, sages like Bharad Vraja may very well call you an incarnation of God, but we cannot do that. We adore the word Brahman. And there's a footnote, and it means Om, the symbol of Brahman. We do not want the human form of God. Rama smiled and went away, pleased with their adoration. But the Nitya and the Leela are two aspects of the same reality. As I've said before, it's like the roof and the steps leading to it. The absolute plays in many ways as Ishwara, as the gods, as man, as the universe. The divine incarnation is the play of the absolute as man. 
Do you know how the absolute plays as man? It is like rushing down of water from a big roof through a pipe. The power of Satchitananda, nay, Satchitananda itself, descends through the conduit of a human form as water descends through the pipe. Only 12 sages, Bharat, Vraja, and the others recognized Rama as an incarnation of God. Not everyone can recognize an incarnation. It is God alone who incarnates himself as man to teach people the way of love and knowledge. Well, what do you think of me? Once my father went to Gaia, and there Raghavir said to him in a dream, I shall be born as your son. Thereupon my father said to him, Oh, Lord, I'm a poor Brahmin. How can I serve you? Don't worry about it, Raghavir replied. It will be taken care of. My sister, Hrita's mother, used to worship my feet with flowers and sandal paste. One day I placed my foot on her head and said to her, her you will die in Benares. Once Madhur Babu said to me, Father, there is nothing inside you but God. Your body is like an empty shell. It may not look from outside like a pumpkin, but inside there's nothing, neither flesh nor seed. Once I saw you as someone moving with a veil on to M. I'm shown everything beforehand. Once I saw Goranga and his devotees singing kirtan in the Panchavati. I think I saw Balaram there and you too. I wanted to know the experiences of Garanga and was shown them at Shambhazar in our native district. A crowd gathered. They even climbed the trees and walls. They stayed with me day and night. For seven days, I had no privacy whatsoever. Thereupon, I said to the Divine Mother, Mother, I've had enough of it. I'm at peace now. I shall have to be born once more. Therefore, I'm not giving all knowledge to my companions with a smile. Suppose I give you all knowledge. Will you then come to me again so willingly? I recognized you on hearing you read the Chaitanya Bhagavat. You are my own, the same substance, like father and son. All of you are coming here again, and when you pull apart the Call me creeper. All the branches come towards you. You are all relatives, like brothers. Suppose Rakal, Harish, and the others had gone to Puri, and you were there too. Would you live separately? Before you came here, you didn't know who you were. Now you will know. It is God who, as the guru, makes one know. Nangta told the story of the tigress and the herd of goats. Once a tigress attacked a herd of goats, and a hunter saw her from a distance and killed her. The tigress was pregnant and gave birth to a cub as she expired. The cub began to grow in the company of the goats, and at first it was nursed by the she-goats, and later on it grew bigger. It began to eat grass and bleat like the goats. Gradually the cub became a big tiger, but still it ate grass and bleated. When attacked by other animals, it would run away, like the goats. One day, a fierce-looking tiger attacked the herd. It was amazed to see a tiger in the herd, eating grass and running away with the goats at its approach. It left the goats and caught hold of the grass-eating tiger, which began to bleat and tried to run away. But the fierce tiger dragged it to the water and said, now look at your face in the water. You see? You've got the pot face of a tiger, exactly like mine. Next, it pressed a piece of meat into its mouth. At first, the grass-eating tiger refused to eat meat. Then it got the taste of the meat and relished it. At last, the fierce tiger said to the grass-eating tiger, what a disgrace. You lived with the goats and ate grass like them. Then the other was really ashamed of himself. <laughs> Eating grass is like enjoying lust and greed. To bleat and run away like a goat is to behave like an ordinary man. Going away with a new tiger is like taking shelter with the guru, 
who awakens one's spiritual consciousness and recognizing him alone as one relative. To see one's face rightly is to know one's real self. I will end here. Om Purnamata Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purname Bhavashishate Om Shanti Shanti, Shanti. Filled with Brahman are the things we see. Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is he still the same. <laughs>